As we begin, I ask that you would please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Part of today's story reminds me of the cookie thief. You see, there was a woman in the airport who was waiting to catch a flight, and she bought herself a bag of cookies. It was then that she settled into the chair in the airport lounge and began to read her book. Suddenly, she noticed a man beside her helping himself to her cookies. Not wanting to make a scene, she read on, ate the cookies, and watched the clock. As the daring cookie thief kept on eating the cookies, she got more irritated and said to herself, if I wasn't so nice, I'd blacken his eye. She wanted to move the cookies to the other side, but she just couldn't bring herself to do it. With each cookie that she took, he would take one too. And when only one was left, she wondered what he would do. And then with a smile on his face and a nervous laugh, he took the last cookie and broke it in half. He offered her the other half, and he ate his half. She snatched it from him and thought, Oh, brother, this guy has some nerve, and he's also so rude, why he didn't even have any gratitude. She sighs with relief when her flight was called. She gathered up her belongings and headed for the gate, refusing to look at the ungrateful thief. So she boarded the plane. She sunk into her seat. And it was then that she reached into her bag to go ahead and grab the book that she was reading, trying to forget the incident. Well, next to her book in her bag, there was a bag of cookies. The cookies that they ate in the lounge were not hers. She had been the cookie thief, not him. Today our scripture focuses in on Jesus eating at Simon the Pharisee's house. And there is this sort of turning that happens, kind of like the cookie thief story. And it closely mirrors the actions of the Pharisee. Another thing to think about as we head into this story is what is expected when you have someone over for dinner. Think about it. I know that when I arrive at someone's house, I expect to be greeted. And if it's a cold day, I expect them to offer to take my coat and store it in the proper place. I expect them to show me into either the dining room or the living room, wherever they want me to be. Sometimes it's nice to be offered a seat to sit in. Sometimes... You know, what, what's your beverage order? Can I get you a glass of water goes on? And this might take a few minutes, but it's what is expected in our culture when we visit someone's home for dinner. And the thing is, I bring this because Jesus would have expected to have a place when he walked into the Pharisee's house for dinner. He would have expected a place to wash his dusty feet. He would expect a greeting often a greeting with a kiss. He would have expected some oil for his head. And with all of these things in mind, here's the gospel, Luke 7, beginning with the 36th verse. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. And he went into the Pharisee's house and took his place at the table. And a woman in the city who was a sinner Having learned that he was eating in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster jar of ointment. She stood behind him at his feet, weeping, and began to bathe his feet with her tears and to dry them with her hair. Then she continued kissing his feet and anointing them with ointment. 
So Jesus enters and sits down, and it's then that the fun begins. A woman, a sinner, whose sin was so great that everybody knew about it, she comes in. And she's the one who's doing the job that the host was supposed to do, taking care of Jesus' feet, offering a kiss. But the other thing is, is that when she enters the house, she enters with a sign of, of shame, a sign of mourning. You see, her hair was down. We're told that she was able to wipe Jesus' feet with her hair. And in that day, if your hair wasn't pulled up, it was a sign of shame and mourning. So her actions made Simon think. The gospel says, now when the Pharisee who had invited him saw it, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would have known who and what kind of woman this is who is touching him, that she is a sinner. And it's interesting here that that, uh, Simon isn't speaking, but he rather thinks this. This is one prominent theme in, in some ancient Jewish literature. What one says to oneself either is indicated as something that is wise or foolish. So when Jesus exposes Simon's foolishness because Jesus is able to say what Simon is thinking. The gospel says that Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Teacher, he said, speak. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the the debts of both of them. Now which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the greater debt. And Jesus said to him, You have judged rightly. And in here is the crux of the passage. Jesus is telling Simon and the woman that they are both sinners. Both have a debt that needs to be paid. But Simon doesn't think that he needs anything, but he does. And Jesus is the only one who was able to pay the debt that each of them owes. And the thing is that this is the same with us. That we sin, and we are unable to earn or to get forgiveness any other way than by the death and resurrection of Jesus. We owe a great debt that is paid for by Jesus. And this is the good news, that our Lord comes to forgive, to set us free from the bondage of sin. After the parable, the gospel picks up saying, Then turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has bathed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You gave me no kiss, but from the time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. Hence she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven loves little. Then he said to her, Your sins are forgiven. But those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This passage reveals for us who Jesus is. He is the Lord. He is the one who forgives sins, even the woman in the city's sins. He even forgives the sins of an arrogant Pharisee. Do you remember the cookie thief? Yeah, she is so much like Simon that it's eerie. Here, they all are in need of Jesus' forgiveness. And the thing is that we also see who we are in this passage. 
We identify both with the Pharisee and the woman. When we want to say that we're doing okay, or at least we're not like them, we're acting like the Pharisee. So many times we shame the sinner. Our minds judge others based on what they have on, what sports they like to play or watch. We judge each other based on race, on our education levels, where we live, what car we drive. Those who are on food stamps get eye rolls in the groceries, and the list goes on. And as soon as we judge, as soon as we judge Simon as arrogant and ungrateful, we are showing those same qualities in our own lives. And of this we must repent. Our hearts need to turn to the reality that each of us is created in the image of God. Each of us is a beautiful reflection of our Lord. And there are times when we get it. There are times when we show up humbled with shame, with mourning. There are times when our heart cries with gratitude for the amazing grace that saved a wretch like me. There are times, these times, when we are forgiven and we are like the woman who shows up knowing that life is full of sin, knowing the need for forgiveness to be restored to wholeness. And God sees the heart and knows the inner person. And when God renders the verdict, forgiven is the total and absolute Since none of us are deserving of such a verdict, all of us are deserving of such a verdict. God's grace is equally poured out on us. And this is the freedom that is ours. We get to go from this place today forgiven and free. But what we do with that is up to us. When you had the same opportunity is Nelson Mandela. When Bill Clinton met Mandela for the first time, he had one question on his mind. When you were released from prison, Mr. Mandela, the former president, said, I woke my daughter at 3 o'clock in the morning. I wanted her to see this historic event. And then Bill Clinton zeroed in on his question. As you marched from the cell block across the yard to the gate of the prison, the camera focused in on your face, and I have never seen such anger, even hatred, in any man as was expressed on your face at that time. That's not the Nelson Mandela that I know today, said Clinton. What was that about? And then Mandela answered, I'm surprised that you saw that, and I regret that the cameras caught my anger. As I walked across the courtyard that day, I thought to myself, they have taken everything from you that matters. Your cause is dead. Your family is gone. Your friends have been killed, and now they're releasing you, but there's nothing left for you out there. And I hated them for what they had taken from me. Then I sensed an inner voice in me saying, Nelson, for 27 years you were their prisoner, but you were always a free man. Don't allow them to make you into a free man only to return as their prisoner. This is the good news, that we are forgiven and set free. And we are forgiven because of who God is. It's not our own doing. And now as free brothers and sisters in Christ, you get to go from this place. Free men, free women of God. Don't return to the prison of sin. But live free. Live as God has set you free for the sake of the world in Jesus Christ. Amen.